Welcome back to another edition of Diamond Star Stories here on White Sox Fan Card Collector. I hope everyone's having a great weekend. We're going to get this started. We have two cards to show you tonight. We're going to start first and foremost with card number 10 in the set. This is Leroy Mahaffey. Often also went by Roy, as you can see on the card here. So I'm going to put Roy here. Sorry about the glare. The light behind me is really strong tonight because it's very sunny, even though I have the blinds closed. They're still showing a lot of sun behind them, so I apologize that it's not as dark that I ideally would want. Um, so I'm trying to angle this a little bit so you can at least see the card. All right, so Roy is pictured here as a member of the St. Louis Browns, which was the last team he played for. He ended his career in 1936, but debuted back in 1926 um, with the Pittsburgh Pirates and played for a couple seasons before he went back to the minors leagues and actually went with the Philadelphia A's. What's interesting about this card and the set itself is this is a 1936 edition, as you can see from the flip on the top there. So you can see at the top there it says 1936. And as I kind of mentioned before, these were released over the series of three years using the same images. What's different about this one is you can tell in actually three ways. You can tell this card is different from the 1934 or the 1935 edition. Because Roy would have been in all three because he's a low numbered card. That was also reissued in all of 1935's editions had reissues of the cards in the lower series. And in 1936, they had select ones um, from the lower series that were reissued, and Roy was one of them. In his cards from 34 and 36 on the front, you can tell the difference is because he has the A's emblem or the A's logo on his uniform. Here it's removed. As you can see, I don't, they didn't really do much to make it look much like a St. Louis Browns uniform, but it's pretty normal. Other than that, the card's got that wonderful Art Deco color and design. Um, I think it's just kind of a beautiful picture with all the contrasting colors you can kind of see in here from the stands in the background, uh, which are also have green and yellow at the top to the field below that has sort of green and yellow. The yellow is supposed to be kind of like the brown, if you will, but I don't know if they could really get that kind of brown color just right with it. So they had to do the contrast with the glove and the shoes, obviously. And then the sky is bright red, which I think is really kind of interesting. Uh, again, it's very Art Deco-ish. Um, and on the back, the other ways you can tell, first and foremost, the lettering is going to be in blue. All the 1936 cards have lettering that's in blue. Otherwise, you're looking at, for 35 and 34, they're going to be in green. And then there's two things. One within the text, you can see that he's now with the St. Louis Browns. This is written pretty clearly at the top of the card here. Uh, and also below, they have his 1935 stat line here, as well as a, this actually says, I think, 1934 trademark on here, even though this was produced in 1936. So I'm not sure why it said that per se. I'd have to look that one up a little bit more in depth, why they didn't change the trademark on there. Maybe they're trademarking the image more than they were the actual content of the card. And when it was issued, because it was issued, obviously, in 1936. All right, so... Roy, there wasn't a lot to look up on him. He uh, debuted with the Pittsburgh Pirates back in 1926, was pitched for a couple seasons, and then he was back in the minors. Um, he didn't really have a lot of opportunities when he was with Pittsburgh. And then while in the minor leagues, he was signed by Connie Mack and brought over to the Philadelphia A's. So he was, in fact, part of their World Series winning team in 1930. He was on the active roster there. His best season, he won 15 games in 1931 and lost just four. His ERA was 421, but otherwise, his career record of 67 and 49 and a 501 ERA was pretty pedestrian. He actually walked more batters than he struck out in his career, his major league career. And by the time he came to 1935, or 1936, I should say, when this card was produced, uh, Connie Mack was in the process of selling off his players because of the financial woes that the Philadelphia A's were having. So he was one of the players that got sold off to St. Louis, and this would be St. Louis Browns. Uh, hence, that's why he's with the card uh, there on there. Well, I don't know why Siri just uh, turned on, but Siri did, so I'm going to turn off Siri here. Sorry about that. That was very interesting. Um, Siri was just letting us know that the Athletics won the 1930 World Series, even though I did not ask for that. And they were letting us know who they played, which was pretty interesting. Uh, other things of note, he left uh, the Browns and actually was traded into the American Association and played with Milwaukee and played with a few other minor league teams for a few more seasons afterwards before his career was kind of over. 
Um, he, there wasn't much about him after his life after baseball, but clearly he did live a life. He moved back to South Carolina, became a uh, involved with the local church. He was a deacon in it in Anderson, uh, South Carolina. And he had three sons and one daughter and many grandchildren at the time of his death when he was still a relatively young guy. Uh, maybe not a young guy for his time, but in my time it sure is at 65. Um, so other things about Roy is, you know, I think this is a good example where you can get really cool cards of from great sets um, by just getting the common card. So he also appears in 33 Gaudi. He's also in like the 34 to 36 batter up cards. And you can get his cards, graded edition of the cards, pretty affordable for a major leaguer that was part of a World Series team. So just something to consider, you know, if you're trying to like put together a collection of vintage cards uh, and you can't afford a lot of the Hall of Famers is you can actually go and chase after some of these cards. Uh, the lesser known players and get some really cool cards from some of those sets. All right, so that is Roy. We're going to put him up in the corner here. And we're going to introduce you to what I thought was just a fascinating story. And when I was looking up information on this player, all I really knew about him that he was a Hall of Famer. When I bought this card, it's also my newest edition in my collection. So that's kind of a cool thing. I haven't shown it on the channel yet. And that he has the most hits of any player that doesn't have 3,000 hits. So he's just he's one closest to that threshold in his career. And that's kind of an interesting story about that is when he was asked about it, and I'm showing you now a 1935 Sam Rice, is what the, he didn't actually, wasn't even aware that he was that close and that it would be that big of a deal. He wasn't really tracking his stats at that time. Um, and that he would have like liked to have actually gotten 3,000 hits by, by the time he realized that he was already like in his mid-40s, even though he was invited to come back to try and get the 13 hits he needed to do it. But he's like, no, nah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I didn't want to come back. Uh, so Sam Rice, here he is pictured with the Cleveland Indians, which was the only season he played for the Indians, which was in 1934. Um, he had a, a 35 release because they reissued his card. I don't know if he has a 36 reissued card because he was actually retired by that point. Uh, so this is actually a 35 reissue uh, on this one. So uh, Sam Rice, he lived uh, to be 84, was born in 1890. And what's kind of interesting about him is he had active years from 1915 through 1934 and retired at the age of 44. Uh, but then he came to the major leagues a little bit later because of some things that happened in his life. Um, and kind of became sort of a traveler of the world, if you will, before he actually kind of settled into professional baseball. And he actually came in as a pitcher and was converted into a position player, later an outfielder. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but some things to know about him before we go over like, his career stats. He um, was married at a very early age and he was part of his family farm and attended uh, obviously high school and started working on his family farm and started uh, working at a very early age like many people did at the turn of the, of the last century. He married at the age of 18 um, and he and his wife, then two years younger than him, had two children. Uh, but what was kind of interesting, uh, it was actually pretty tragic, is a few years later um, in, I believe it was 1914, I, don't, I didn't write down the year, I, I think it was 1914, while he was actually playing some semi-pro ball uh, at that time with a, I believe, a textile uh, manufacturer. So he's part of the uh, company team and he was playing some semi-pro leagues through that. He... Um, was out of town at that time, and he received um, a telegram. He received a telegram letting him know that there was a massive tornado that hit his hometown where his family lived. And at the time when he was out of town and because he was playing on uh, the circuit, this semi-professional circuit, his wife and his children had moved in with his parents into their family farm, and the tornado hit that farm dead on. Um, he was notified immediately that he lost his mother, his two younger sister, his wife, and his two children in that, and later his father from the injuries. Um, so I can only imagine just like how much of like a personal set that back that may was for him kind of per personally. And uh, obviously, you know, he was probably devastated, I imagine, at that time. And 
was trying to kind of figure things out. So he did, did go back to the semi-pro team, but didn't they stay there very long because he enlisted into the Navy at that time. It actually was positioned on a ship, a battleship that was uh, stationed just outside of Mexico and was involved with a um, conflict within Mexico when there was a change in government uh, that uh, the United States was backing someone that um, was, I think, ousted, I believe, from power and uh, the United States kind of intervened uh, with the people that were saying they were in power and there was a, it was definitely a, a, a battle and a skirmish at that time between the United States forces and uh, the Mexican government forces and also the, the Mexican resistance forces. So they eventually like won that conflict and he was there in Mexico for a little while. Um, while he was actually in the Navy, he was part of the battleships uh, team. It was very common at that time for each crew to kind of have like a sports team, specifically a baseball team, because that was so popular. Uh, and he was part of that team and he was pitching for that team and they would fight against, you know, or go against that not fight, but go against other battleships and, and you know, other naval, uh, uh, you know, ships and uh, locations and things like that where they would actually go visit and there would be like a little circuit that would happen professionally with them. Uh, so eventually he got repositioned as a ship got moved to Virginia and went back to, I believe, Dry Dock where he was able to, on furlough, uh, go and play semi-pro. He was actually able to sign with a... Actually, this was a professional team, the, a class team that was part of the Class C uh, minor league association. I'm not sure with like, I think it was just Class C, but I'm not sure who it was affiliated with, but he was with a team called the Goobers. Oh, here it is. It was in the Virginia State League. So he would play there on furlough when he wasn't on the ship. And he actually got noticed during this time by two senators from Virginia, Senator Thomas Martin and Claude Swanson who said, hey, he's pretty good. We'd like for him to play for this team full time and arranged for him to be released from the Navy um, or petitioned and also arranged for him to be released from the Navy at that time from his commitment, obviously, to be able to stay in the Navy at that moment and became a full time pitcher with the Goobers. Um, so you kind of advance ahead. He, you know, it's it, it's a few years after that. Um, he's noticed by Clark Griffith of the obviously Washington Senators. He was the part-time, or he was the part owner of that team. And he uh, arranged for him to be, for his release from the Goobers to actually join the Washington Ball Club at that point. So that's how he became a Senator in a very strange way. You know, he's in the Navy one year and he's pitching like just part-time, if you will, on his furloughs with a, with a minor league team. He's noticed these Senators are like, he's pretty good, let's get him full-time on the team and then he's noticed by the major leagues through the Washington Senators and just within a matter of time he's already on the Senators. So he came in as a pitcher um, and he pitched uh, partially for parts of two seasons uh, while he was at the Senators and it was pretty quick that they noticed that you know he's he's decent as a pitcher but he's also pretty good as a hitter and he's actually a really good athlete so let's see if we can try and find another way to use him so they started using him as a pitch hitter. Uh, and he was doing exceptionally well as a pinch hitter, so they wanted to get him in the lineup more often. By the time they got to the 19, uh, in the later part of the 1915 season, he was a full-time uh, outfielder for the Washington Senators, uh, which is where he played for the entirety of his career was in the outfield uh, for the Senators, uh, and, and eventually for the Indians at the very end of his career. Uh, other things we're going to note is that he uh, did get uh, pulled or drafted, if you will, to actually sign up for an enlist in World War I, which he did. Um, and by the time he actually got to Europe, the armistice was signed. So he spent the, the latter part of the winter that year just kind of touring parts of Europe before he came back and didn't miss a hitch and didn't miss a season. He returned to full time playing baseball. Um, which was kind of interesting because he really didn't miss any time, even though he was officially an enlisted man during that conflict, but he didn't actually see any action during it. Uh, he remarried in 1920, uh, and he and his wife at that time owned a farm until his retirement, uh, and then this is when his baseball career was flourishing. Uh, sadly, his wife later passed, and when he was retired, uh, while they, they were in their 50s, and he did remarry, 
at that time uh, in 1959, which was two years after his second wife's passing. Um, and, and just other things of note, like during his you know, time after baseball, he got really into investing and developing properties, playing golf and appearing in charity baseball games as often as he could. So he did a lot of charitable endeavors for the other members of his Washington Senators teams uh, and spent a lot of time hanging out with them as much as he could uh, in his retirement and did quite well. So this is actually someone that clearly had a good mind for business and was uh, kind of using his resources in, in a way to kind of develop himself further after his retirement because he had, I guess, a pretty good farm going on a poultry farm. Uh, with his second wife um, before she passed. So during his playing career, again, he was active from, um, which is the wrong notes, I'm going to find here and get the right one. He was active from 1915 all the way to 1934. Um, he had end, end, ended with a war of 54.3. He had, again, 2,987 hits, and he had a career 322 average. Uh, he twice led the AL in hits, and once in triples and once in stolen bases. Um, but he also hit over 600 hits 200 times, hit over 300 in all but five seasons. And he once had a career high of 350, but also he almost matched that at the age of 40 when he hit 349. Uh, so this guy could hit. Um, he was definitely, he was part of the World Series team in 1924. A uh, team that obviously is associated a lot with Walter Johnson, but he was like the probably the next big player on that team. Um, just kind of a name that's kind of lost a little bit in history. I think we don't often think about like how great he probably was during this period of time. Maybe because he was on Washington or maybe because he wasn't Walter Johnson. Not sure exactly why we don't really think of Sam Rice, but when you kind of look at his numbers in comparison to his peers during that time, he was a star. He definitely was a star and probably maybe the second or third best team during the American League during that entire period of time. Obviously, we with the Yankees, number one, and maybe the A's, number two. Um, so he was a legitimate star. Um, as you can see in this one, uh, just got really cool background. You see the grandstands that are kind of the stadium behind him. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be any one stadium that's supposed to be designed after. I don't believe that it is. Doesn't look like the Cleveland Stadium to me, but uh, still a really cool picture nevertheless. Um, it's, even though it's a two, I think it's a pretty solid two. On the back, they have his 1934 stats, which were his final stats. Uh, and they talk just a little bit about his uh, accuracy at throwing the baseball, which I guess he had a really good throwing arm was known also for his prowess in the outfield. I can imagine he probably did have a pretty good arm considering he was a major league pitcher as well before he even like took the field as a outfielder. So that's what I got for you. The two Diamond Star players for this month. Uh, we got Roy Mahaffey and Sam Rice. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll be back soon just probably with kind of wrapping up some of the last bit of mail I've gotten um, since my last video and probably the last I'll get for a little while as I'm kind of prepping up for the national and I hope to see you all soon. Hope you enjoyed this.